baby's crying. I forgot everything I was about to say. The joys of motherhood. Sounds like dad has everything under control. Let me check my notes and we could go on, okay? I've lost track of my thoughts completely. Hi everyone, it's Melissa, your Plantita Abogada here at Tasteful Nodes, coming to you today with a non-aeroid episode. So today's topic is going to be about five stunning types of plants that you should have in your collection that are not aeroids. Before I get started, as you can see, I've got a whole bunch of plants to show to you. It's probably best to get my disclaimers and a little bit of housekeeping out of the way before the toddler completely destroys everything and comes out here and wrecks the whole place up. <laughs> He's in a mood today. So, disclaimer number one, KK Bitayo, Kanya Kanyang Bayad. By now, I'm sure our Westerner friends know the phrase, we each pay our own way. Like I said, we've got some great plants here um, on the table today. And while I do recommend these 10 out of 10, um, what I don't recommend is spending your rent money on these things. So please, please, please don't do that. I know some of you have. I'm not paying any plant child support, so don't come after me, okay? Number two, I am not an expert. I am a lawyer by profession. I just happen to read a lot. So when I do provide any factual information in this video, I'll be sure to put the source at the bottom of the screen just in case you need to use this information for any citing for academic purposes, okay? Number three. Since I'm not an expert, I would really appreciate it if you got a second opinion from the people in your area who have dealt with these plants. So what I'm referring to um, as far as speaking with others in your area, they don't have to be experts, but what they do need to do is have some experience growing these guys and doing them successfully. So successful experience growing, they can give you advice as to where to buy them at probably cheaper pricing, things along the, that nature. Find the experts um, in your community, whether they're professional growers or hobbyists, and by all means, please get a second opinion on everything I presented to you today. Housekeeping. If you haven't followed this channel yet, why haven't you? <laughs> Don't forget to follow this channel, subscribe, click that notification bell so you get future updates um, when I release new video. Yeah, let's do that, okay? And you know, feel free to share this information with your friends. Hopefully I'm providing information that others can't understand. But while I'm doing that, I'm making sure to provide this information that is only backed up by scientific fact, okay? Or my personal observations for that matter. Because as you can see, these guys are pretty much flourishing here. <laughs> okay, so I'm an expert in my area. Yeah, that's it. My little territory here in the world. So looking at the content that I've uploaded, I realized that I have a whole bunch of aeroidy stuff. And my garden isn't just filled with aeroids. I do have, at last count last year, about 922 plants. There are a lot of propagations there as well, but I do have a lot of different types of plants, as you can see here. And it's important to diversify just a little bit, just because, you know, variety is the spice of life. <laughs> and it definitely keeps things interesting. It, increases your level of knowledge I think as far as testing new new plants you know seeing what your skills are seeing if you could identify how to care for these guys so by all means would absolutely recommend going outside of your comfort zone a little bit when it comes to planting just not to keep things monotonous I think so I've got five different types of plants here on this table and I would say that all of these guys are actually pretty easy to care for, at least in my experience. I wouldn't try to recommend them if I didn't find them easy. I think what is most important in caring for these plants, just like I mentioned earlier, is trying to figure out what works for them. When you have a general idea of what works for a certain type of plant, it kind of gives you an idea of how to take care of the rest of them. And then everything after that is kind of trial and error because you know, not everything on the internet is true. So let's go ahead and jump in, shall we? So first up are Sansevierias. And the Sansevierias that I have on the table are this guy, which is a Sansevieria flamingo. This guy, who is a Sansevieria white royal crown. Gorgeous, gorgeous plant. And then this guy, who is a Sansevieria black bajo. And I'll go ahead and provide close-up shots for you so you can see 
um, what I'm working with here. And also probably a matured version of the Black Bajo because he's a juvie right now and he doesn't do his matured form justice. So I'm really looking forward to this guy. Anyway, Sansevieras were originally their own genus, but just recently it was discovered through some testing that they actually are very, very closely related to Dracaena. And they have been since moved to the genus Dracaena. I believe it was 12 or 14 plants that have been renamed under that genus. And um, I think it was one Sansevieria that actually didn't make it make the transition. So that's an interesting fact that I would have to look in the future, but I didn't have time <laughs> to do that just because of how busy things got. These are colloquially, you know what, why am I making my life difficult? These are commonly known as mother-in-law tongue and snake plants. And normally people will tell you, you know, it's always on the list of the easiest plants to grow. They're like, yeah, get a Sansevieria. You can't kill it. If this was the Mari Povich show, it's at this point that I would be reading off something saying, and the results say, that's a lie. <laughs> I've killed a few um, Sansevierias um, earlier on when I was just, actually no, I hadn't even start, started collecting plants. I just wanted plants in my house. So we're talking about the early 2000s. These guys are quite hardy. They're succulents, just by the name, succulent, tender, juicy, right? Yeah, you get the idea. These guys don't like being drowned in water, and old me had no clue whatsoever. You know, old me just said, oh no, my plant is turning yellow, what do I do? Newer me actually realizes that this plant, it doesn't like being watered so much. It can handle its water. This is the big disclaimer for these guys, is that they will tolerate being watered as long as their media is well draining. There you go. So as long as their media is well draining, these guys will do fine being watered often. For the white crown, I've got a lot of pebbles. I've got perlite. I've got like a, I've got some coconut choir. And that would be the moisture retaining ingredient in my mix for these guys. And they are growing wonderfully. They get watered on the same schedule my aeroids get watered. Just because it would be too difficult for me to have to water everybody on a different schedule when they're all mixed together in the same area. I guess that would be my greatest tip from this episode, if there was anything, is know your plants needs and make the necessary adjustments so that they can actually accommodate your lifestyle. When your life is easier, your plants will flourish. They'll be even better. Just because you're not in a stressful place, they're not in a stressful place, life is good, right? Same goes for Sansevierias. With these guys, I have them in a indirect lighting situation. So we've got bright and direct light. This is the swimming pool area, so what else? With these guys, I think the biggest pest problem I've ever had were scales. And easily enough remedied, I use a neem solution, neem oil solution mixed with some dishwashing liquid. I know that there's some fancy insecticidal plant soaps out there, and I haven't had the opportunity to try it yet just because of what limited options I have here. But the neem mix works well. Spray it on, leave it for a few minutes, 15 to 30 minutes. Take your soft bristled toothbrush, like some of the old stuff that you've used and um, that you've sanitized with some hot water. And then just brush it off, brush the scales off, watch them come off. The most important thing about dealing with neem and scales is that you wash these thoroughly. So you wash the, the neem off of these plants thoroughly and make sure that they're not in a place where they could be exposed to sunlight because the neem will burn if you do have any remaining on the leaves. Yeah, so with these guys, absolutely um, recommend, easy enough to care for, and as far as propagation is concerned, sometimes you'll have little babies come out of the side, or you can propagate via leaf cuttings, especially the Sansevieras like Trifasciata, I think is how it's pronounced. Cut the top, put it in some media, and you know, watch it root, watch it grow. With these guys, I haven't tried propagating, so I can't say specifically for these guys if they would grow the same way. I would assume so, just because it has a similar leaf to the Boncel. But 
I haven't tried it, so I won't recommend it. And <laughs> don't say that I told you so, okay? Because I'm not recommending it. The second plant on our list are caudiciforms. And I have a few of them here. Here's one little caudiciform right here. I have a potato right here. There we go. Come out, potato. And I'll put close up so that you can see them better. And then I have one more right here. And let me get this over here. And this is what I'm referring to when I say potato, right? According to the Division of Agriculture at the University of Arkansas, a caudiciform is a type of plant that exhibits short, fat, and swollen trunks, um, which are referred to as caudix. So one thing about caudiciforms is that while there are some cacti that also exhibit the same characteristics of short, um, round, swollen stems, the caudiciforms, the caudixes themselves, don't photosynthesize. Their purpose is to hold water in times of drought. So I have names here for you guys, just in case you're interested in any of these plants. So this gorgeous guy right here is a Philanthus mirabilis. And let me put him down really quick. And then this guy is an Adenia. Adenia dorset horn. And it's a cute little guy. Look at this. And this potato right here, the potato that I was referring to, with the um, trellis for its leaves, that is actually a Syningia bucotrich. And if you have a close up look at the stems and the leaves of the plant, you'll see these fine hairs on them. And they kind of remind me of the same things that, that air plants, that telanches have, which are called trichomes. And I don't know for sure if that's the purpose of the hairs on the leaves and stems, but we'll find out soon enough. Some popular caudiciforms on the market include ponytail palm, that giant guy right behind me up there in the back. Yeah, he's a few decades old. He belongs to my mother-in-law and he's an amazing, amazing plant. Also the Stefania series. So you have Stefania suberosa and Stefania erecta, gorgeous plants. I had an erecta in my collection that I really enjoyed watching wake up with each rainy season except a rat decided to take a bite out of her because I guess she looked too potato-y and just completely destroyed her. It was heartbreaking. In pop culture, I think we have the baobab trees that a lot of people are pretty familiar with. If you've ever seen the movie or read the book, The Little Prince, yeah, those are those baobab trees that he kept digging out of his planet, right? That, that were taking over. You've seen them on National Geographic, I believe, those baobab trees are located in Madagascar. Um, can't remember which part of Africa. And I believe Australia. So baobab trees, excellent plants, gorgeous, really cool. So the fourth type of plant that I would recommend to anybody looking to venture out of um, aeroids are telanchas. If you're familiar with the name telancha, you know that I'm talking about air plants. So we've got right here um, the Tilantia malidofitas. It's a Philippine made hybrid. We've got right here Tilantia showtime, which is a hybrid by uh, Mark Dimmitt. And we've got the Tilantia novacii, which is a species plant right here. So with Tilantias, they can either be epiphytes which are plants that begin their life cycles in trees, or they can be lithophytes, lithophytes, <laughs> which are plants that actually begin their life cycles on rocks. Interesting. The, let me go see if I have any evidence. So if you look at the Malidofetus right here, let me pull her out. So if you look at the Malidofetus, the roots function as a means of stabilizing a plant of attaching it to something and there it is it's attached to this little um, plate right back here so it doesn't really function in a way that traditional plants do where the roots are responsible for uptake of nutrients and water oh no vaki i love you too it does have a function and that's to provide the plant stability in whichever growing conditions it is in what does provide the plant nutrition 
would be the leaves. So on these leaves, and I'll go ahead and get close up video because the Novakii is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. On the leaves are these tiny fine vessels, like these hairs. It's a little bit fuzzy, like think um, velvet, like really low pile velvet. So very, very, very low. It's just fuzzy. And um, these trichomes, which I mentioned earlier, remember when I was talking about the Syningia leucotrich? So when I was talking about that, I was referring to these guys. And I'll put a close up on the screen right now. But the leuco <laughs> leucotrichs, but the trichomes actually serve as the vessels or hairs that absorb nutrition and moisture for air plants. And it's such a cool little plant because you don't need soil to put it in, right? You just need something to attach it to or to display it in. Voila! So with my air plants, I have a lot of them growing in my greenhouse. This is under shaded conditions, of course. So I think it's a 70% shade net. So I have some friends like Marco Yagas who actually grows his air plants on his roof. And a lot of them are exposed to direct sunlight. And it's amazing because the direct sunlight actually pulls all of these great colors out of the tillanches. Only thing is, is that you can't just throw your tillanches out in direct sunlight. You just can't do it. It'll burn and it won't be pretty. So if you do want to expose your tillanches to more to brighter light, if you want to get sun stress coloring, which is like a typical red, orange, really pretty you would have to expose your tillandsia to brighter lights over a period of time rather than just <laughs> all at once. It doesn't work like that. As far as watering, like I said, these guys are exposed to the elements because they're in my greenhouse. So they get watered whenever everything else gets watered. I don't know if I would recommend to throw a tillandsia outside and leave it to the elements unless you've, again, trained it like you've trained it with the light to absorb water and to remove water as quick as possible. Because the biggest problem for tillanches is because of how they're built. Let's have a look at the showtime. Because of how they're built. Oh my gosh, my hand. So because of how they're built, tillanches tend to take water through their leaves, right? But the water also trickles down into the body of the plant. And that's where water gets trapped. And when you have water trapped, you're in big trouble or actually your tillanche is in big trouble because that is actually a recipe for rot. And once the rot starts, it's really hard to, one, capture it as it happens, two, to actually save your tillanche from dying. These guys are exposed to the elements and they're used to my conditions here, which is fantastic. There's a lot of growth come rainy season. They, they enjoy it. During the summer months, Oh my gosh, I have to water them every day. I have to water them every day, it's bad. And watering your tillandsia that's outdoors isn't much of a problem if you've got good air circulation, if the water dries up fast. If the water doesn't dry up fast, you're in trouble. Again, water will end up inside your tillandsia and rot. Sometimes you gotta go somewhere, your tillandsias are in covered areas and you don't know what to do. This is what I did. Um, when I was faced with that issue. I actually soaked these guys. Yeah, I soaked them. And what I did was after soaking, I, I would have my table set up where I would have all of these tillanches <laughs> hanging out upside down on these tables. So I would have these little containers that could help prop these guys up and hold it upside down. Um, just because it would help drain the plant. So the trichomes absorbed what was needed. All of these leaves have all these trichomes. And any excess that were inside the plant were drained because they were upside down. There are some plants, there are some tillanches that I worry about doing this method with. So the Showtime, which is a hybrid by Mark Dimmitt, is a hybrid between tillantia streptophylla and tillantia bulbosa. And the bulbosa parent is the one that worries me because bulbosas are have these really bulbous, as you can tell by the name, bulbous um, bodies, and they're pretty compact. So it's not like the water could come out as easily as, let's say, this guy, the Novakii, where the leaves are kind of open. 
it drains well. That worries me. So with those guys, I would typically have them in shallower containers with water and I would just have the plant dunked upside down so that only the leaves were in the water and not the base itself because the base is the problem when it comes to rot with these plants. For those who are wondering, the Tilantia Mali Defitas, like I mentioned earlier, is a Philippine hybrid from the Philippine um, royal family of Tilantias, the Defitases of Bacolod. And in fact, Mali is named after one of their daughters. The Mali Defitas is a hybrid between Tilantia Caput Medusae and Tilantia Bulbosa. So they have a similar parent, shared parent between these two. Propagation for these guys is fairly easy. Uh, as you can see down here on the Tilantia Showtime, got babies. Yeah, so after the flower, no, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a process to this thing, you know, right? Romance before anything else. So, romance. The plants, the Tilantias, tend to turn a different color when they're about to flower. So the tips, the very tops of the leaves will start turning red. Um, there's an Ionantha that turns yellow. And that's when you know the flower is gonna come out. So the flower comes out and you're like, yay, flowering time. Yes, flowers mean babies, right? For Tilantias, it also means that your Tilantia is on a very limited lifespan at that point, but that's okay because babies. Let me get a Tilantia that everyone is familiar with, okay? I'll be right back. Okay. So Tilantia that everyone um, who's ever owned a Tilantia is familiar with is the Tilantia Ionantha. So these guys are the ones that are typically for sale everywhere. I mean everywhere, right? When these guys flower, it's a cute little flower that comes out here and everyone's happy about it until they find out that their Tilantia is going to die. You know, circle of life but it takes a while before these plants die and you get to actually enjoy them growing their babies. And I'll go ahead and zoom in on this, but the Tilantia babies are like, I got one right here. I probably have more coming out elsewhere. But when the Tilantia babies grow, I don't pull them out at this age yet, okay? Um, I would pull them out when they're one third of the parent's size. And then at that point, give them their own container, whether it be a plate, um, or one of those pots. The pot is actually filled with materials that are really well, well draining. The purpose of it, again, to have materials in a pot is not for sustenance or nutrition, but for something that the Tilantia could hang on to. So inside the pot is some coconut cube and a lot of pumice, big size pumice, big kind. You can also propagate your Tilantias via seeds, which I have not done because I don't have the patience to wait two years for them to develop. <laughs> I don't have the patience. But the Defitases, um, when we visited their garden in Bacolod, actually showed us a whole bunch of stuff that they had propagated by seed. And it's just amazing because, again, these are hybridizers. They make their hybrids and they propagate everything by seed. And then they choose the best representations of plants that they had in mind, you know, the characteristics of the plants that they combined. And that's it for Tilantias. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to my fourth recommended plant um, outside of aeroids. And that would be ferns. So we've got two kinds of ferns here. We've got um, platycerium, which are right down there, those two guys. They're called staghorn ferns commonly, but there are a whole bunch of platyceriums and a whole bunch of hybrids on top of that. And then over here we have the adiantum. It is more commonly known as maidenhair ferns. So you see these guys right here. With these guys, the care is slightly different between the two of them, and it's really important for you to know which kind of fern you're picking up. I would say that both have their own benefits and drawbacks, but let me go ahead and dive right in right now, okay? First up, the adiantum. You know what? We'll call it by the maidenhair fern. So these guys are great. Give them a rich moisture holding soil, make it something that's not too deep, so a shallower pot, and a pot that has a lot of holes in it that's well draining, right? So the key for these guys is that their substrate be moist, but not sogging wet, because they'll die. What's nice about these guys, <laughs> I'm gonna have to show you video from the greenhouse, is that underneath all of these leaves, all of their fronds, if you have a look at them, are all of these spores. 
they're seeds, if you want to think of them that way. So right down here, all these little black spots are spores. So what happened is we had a maiden hair fern in the greenhouse, and one day it died down to a small little pot of maiden hair fern, because I think it was the summer. And then come rainy season, you know, it came back beautifully. And then came winter time, and we noticed all of these maiden hair ferns popping out of everywhere. So out of soil, out of rock, out of concrete blocks so they were just coming at it everywhere and it turned out that we had that our um, maiden hair fern had a whole bunch of spores underneath it and right now we still have a whole bunch of maiden hair ferns they're growing like weeds in the greenhouse I really enjoy them I think they're gorgeous I'm glad that that we were able to transplant some of them here so transplanting is easy enough same kind of same kind of moisture rich um, potting mix in a pot and you're good to go. So the reason that the moisture rich potting mix is important is because these guys, the median hair ferns, actually absorb nutrients and moisture through their roots. So in addition to needing moisture for their leaves through humidity, which we have in abundance here in the Philippines, they also need moist um, potting mixtures. Whatever mix you have has to be moist for them, not soaking wet because they will die on you. Unlike that little tidbit, the platyceriums have a root ball, but the, they're not as root ball dependent on nutrition and um, moisture as these guys are. So the platyceriums, and let me go pull one of them. Okay. Oh my gosh. So the platyceriums actually have two fronds, right? They've got this basal frond right down here. It's called a shield frond, basal frond. Basal, not basil, not like the food. So the basal frond is actually an infertile frond. You won't get anything from it, except it does function much like the roots of the um, tillanches do, where the basal frond actually attaches it, attaches the entire fern to whatever is near it. It'll keep growing out of this little area right here until it, it covers everything. Now, it grows along with the antler fronds, which are the fertile fronds of the ferns. The antler fronds also grow out of this area, and as you can see here, they'll just keep getting bigger and bigger. Now, when you mount a fern, you don't want to mess with their root balls. In fact, I try not to. I had one accident where it had fallen to the ground right off of, out of its container. So I had to pick it up and I had to see what was going on. And yeah, some root ball fell out. Don't ever do that. That fern is still recovering and it's recovering nicely. But I've since mounted it onto its own mount. And this is where people, you see them on YouTube or Instagram, TikTok, they mount their ferns onto these gorgeous plaques or, or um, plates, wooden plates. And then they use these, um, fishing string to mount them and you wonder what's going on how do they make the fishing string disappear it's because these fronds will eventually cover up the fishing string as they keep growing out and they'll just keep attaching so it's there for stability the fishing string is there for stability and it's only temporary the frond the basal frond I hate saying basal I keep thinking food the shield frond will do its business and cover that up eventually as well. For these guys, there is some water that's absorbed through the root ball, but for the most part, the water that's absorbed is done so through the fronds. Sorry, I had to make sure that we were okay there. So the water that's absorbed and the nutrition that's absorbed is absorbed through the antler and the shield fronds. And that's why when you water them, not only do you want to water the media that your fern is in um, to keep those roots growing and nice, but you also want to water your fronds because there are hairs on those too that absorb the water, much like tillanches have those hairs, like I mentioned. I have not propagated platycerium just yet, and I don't know if I ever will, but if I ever do, I will make sure I keep you guys posted. So I've discussed water, potting mix, propagations with you. The last and most important thing that I need to discuss with you regarding ferns is sunlight. 
So I have both of these types in bright and direct light. It's important not to put them in direct light because it tends to make the maidenhair ferns shrivel and it tends to burn the patisseriums. So I have them, this guy is actually at our bar section. We have a barbecue bar complete with a wood-fired oven in the back. So it's this bar, but it's also underneath mango trees and it gets bright and direct light from that area and it grows wonderfully there. I mean, in case you can't tell, it will die down a little bit as the summer comes because it's just so intensely hot here, but it comes back every rainy season without fail. The platycerium, I have all of them here in the pool area and that's because I wanna keep closer eyes on them just because yeah, I'm now collecting a few of them and I wanna make sure that I don't harm them like I harmed my last one. We do have morning sun here in this area I still try to keep them out of sunlight. No problems with direct sunlight for these guys. And I think that's it for ferns. Yeah, I think that's it. My final plant on the list are Ipecias. So right here, these guys. And when I say these guys, I mean it. Um, it started out as one plant and it just has a mind of its own and grew. I guess it really liked where it was located and the conditions it grew in because this thing is massive. Um, I don't know if you could see right here behind the Sansevieria and the Platycerium, but it's on the ground or it's on the top of the table. It just takes over our bar area and it's just glorious, it really is. Apicias are actually flowering plants that are part of the African violet family. I know that there are at least 10 species. I'm not too sure about my Apicias. I do have a few of them, but the rest that I do have are hybrids and there are many, many, many hybrids. These guys are natives of tropical areas in Central and South um, America. They enjoy the tropical weather here in the Philippines. So I guess that's why it's doing so well. They are characterized by these gorgeous rosette leaves. I don't know if I can find any for you. So right here, gorgeous rosette leaves come out in a rosette pattern. Um, in a variety of colors. So the leaves range from browns to greens. Um, I have a magenta one. I've owned a Picasso, which I believe is a pink and green one with some cream. Just gorgeous, just gorgeous. Um, I say owned because I lost it in the great greenhouse crash of 2021. Yeah, that was in a good year. But anyway, so the leaves come in a dazzling array of colors. Um, the flowers are also quite gorgeous and they're a variety of flower colors, red, orange, yellows. Um, gosh, have I ever seen white? I don't know. But I also have another friend who lives in Manila and she has a massive collection of these guys. So she's got many, many different kinds. And like I said, so many hybrids. There are so many plants. There's so many apicias to collect. There's so many ways to go. They're also a great plant to propagate. I know I talk about propagation with these other plants and I might as well talk about it with Apicias just because they're so easy. So let me go ahead and pull this guy out in the open. So they, if you're familiar with a strawberry plant, Apicias do the same thing. They have these runners, right? I don't know if that's the proper term for them, but they've got these runners that give off brand new plants. So all you would need to do for a brand new plant is snip, put it on top of media. You don't wanna you bury it in the media, you wanna put it on top and let the thing root. And I'll go ahead and provide a close up, but underneath there are some rough, really rough, tiny roots growing and it will root on its own, provided you keep the perfect balance of moisture on in its media, not sogging wet. It does not like having wet feet. I think that's what my friend in Manila said. Hi, Ati Lydia. They don't like being wet. Um, they prefer moisture over wet. So that is something important with these guys. And I mean, you could have them propagated to gift to other friends, um, come holidays or birthdays, anything of that nature. See, this is what I'm talking about. Look at those teeny tiny roots. It's so cute. Snip, put it in a pot. The nice thing about these guys, oh my gosh. Yeah, so check these roots out. Yes, lots of roots that you could snip, put in a pot, some more roots. The nice thing about this 
is you could either keep it in a shallow pot like this is in right now or it's actually in a shallow pot I promise we put something underneath it to elevate it so that it would look so flat on the table but it's in a shallow pot maybe yay big this wide right it's a lot of plant so it deserves its own huge pot huge shallow pot I digress it would be great on a tabletop in a shallow pot or in a hanging basket or like I've done in the past in the ground <laughs> because it makes a great ground cover because it's got that runner quality to it you know as long as you don't have people trampling on your plants because they didn't notice them true story friends so I discussed water I discussed propagation lighting lighting so for these guys I have them in bright and direct areas like I said, the fern, when I was discussing the maiden hair fern, I have this under a mango tree and it's growing beautifully. I have one in my greenhouse, it's that big magenta one, um, under a monstera and it's growing beautifully. It just does really well in, in bright and direct light. I haven't tried it in shade, like indoors, like with indoor lighting. I won't speak to that, okay? I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> I'm not gonna be responsible for killing anyone's plants. But if you do tend to grow them indoors or if you have any plans to grow them indoors, I would take that into consideration is that the growing conditions that seem to make them flourish um, would be a good amount of humidity, probably over 50% like we have here in the Philippines. Bright and direct light. So if you're gonna use grow lights inside the house, make sure it's not like immediately on them because you're just gonna burn your leaves and they will burn. Make sure that they've got that happy little medium and you're good to go. And that is it for this episode. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. If you have any suggestions as to plants um, that you would recommend for someone who wants to try something non aeroidy feel free to leave those down in the comment section too because I read them. I read the comments even if I'm not able to answer all of them. If this video helped you, if this video gave you any ideas, feel free to give it a like, share it with friends, like I said earlier at the beginning of the episode, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe now. Um, click that notification bell so you get notifications of my future episodes. We've got some good stuff coming up. I'm so excited. I promise um, October is going to be fun. If you want to read written guides, I have them on Facebook. I'm there as Tasteful Nodes. If you just want to look at pretty pictures or relaxing videos, check me out on Instagram. Short videos are there. I'm there as tasteful notes as well. Okay, guys, that's it for me today. Until next time, sa ulitin, keep your notes classy and tasteful. Bye.